I was concerned if I stayed in the race, that would be the topic. You'd be interviewing me about why did Nancy Pelosi say, why did so, and, uh, and I thought it would be a real distraction, number one. Number two, when I ran the first time, I thought of myself as being a transition president. I can't even say how old I am. It's hard for me to get out of my mouth. And, uh, but things got moving so quickly, it, it, it didn't happen. That was President Biden's first interview since quitting the race in an exclusive that aired this weekend. And as you heard, President Biden, for the first time, went into detail into what compelled him to drop out. He insisted throughout the interview that this was not over his health or his age, but that he feared his debate performance caused a fracture throughout the party and put several down-ballot races in jeopardy. But is this the whole truth? We know that President Biden, oh, President Obama and Nancy Pelosi had a hand in President Biden's ultimate decision. The question is, who else? There was talk that, that donations came to a screeching halt after President Biden's debate performance on June 27. But between the power players in Washington and the donor class, word on the street is Biden was bullied out of the role by the elite global cabal. Is there any truth to this narrative? Joining us now is best-selling author of Controligarchs, exposing the billionaire class, their secret deals, and the globalist plot to dominate your life. Seamus Bruner returns. Good to have you back. Yeah, hey, Chanel. It's great to be with you. So it absolutely was the moneyed interests who pushed Joe Biden out. Of course, uh, Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi put, played a role. But it all started in really early July. A lot of these big donors, particularly uh, the Hollywood control oligarchs, and this would be uh, Abigail Disney, the uh, granddaughter heiress of the Disney company, uh, a, a guy named Ari Emanuel, that's Rahm Emanuel's brother. They are the ones who pulled the e-brake on Biden and a lot of other donors who kind of remain nameless. They don't want to you know, if you're going to take a shot at the king, you better not miss. And so they're all uh, coming out of the war work now to pledge their support to Kamala. But a lot of these Hollywood guys, George Clooney, who's very close with Obama, he wrote that famous op-ed letter uh, calling for a pause and, and a reassessment on Joe Biden. And so it was the money that pushed him out. They'll cite down ballot. And that's why the money decides not to put uh, their money into Joe Biden. If it's going to be a lost cause, uh, then, yeah, the, all of the, the races are going to be affected if you're not, uh, let's say, pouring millions of dollars into ballot harvesting and get out the vote operations. Then, yeah, the down ticket uh, candidates are going to suffer. And so they all saw the writing on the wall. Um, not everybody went on record before Joe Biden dropped out, but they're all coming on record now in support of Cam Kamala. Well, what you just said, Seamus, adds fuel to a certain bonfire of discussion in Washington. And that bonfire is, you know, there's all these different bonfires of theories, right? And so what you just said kind of adds to the bonfire that the debate was, was pushed onto the Biden campaign so that he would go on earlier, so that they had a little more time to prepare the next candidate before the DNC convention, because I know historically um, part of this discussion also is centered around the fact that normally you have a debate between the two nominees after the convention. Yeah, exactly. This was an unprecedented debate. They got it out of the way early so that they could uh, chuck Joe Biden out of the, the side of the car and put a new candidate in. That would be Kamala. Um, so, yeah, the, I mean, I, the debate was always suspiciously timed to give them enough time to uh, find a new person. I think they wanted to leapfrog Kamala, uh, the big moneyed interests. I mean, with a, let's say a Gavin Newsom or a Gretchen Whitmer, because historically right. Kamala Harris has polled so low that uh, is she even, there's always the question, is she even a better candidate than Joe Biden is? But I think they realized, you know, reality settled in. There's not a very easy way to leapfrog the first uh, person of color, black Indian uh, candidate for uh, president. And so uh, woman, so she, she checks a lot of the diversity boxes. If you were to leapfrog her with uh, like a Gavin Newsom, that would just be a really bad look. And a lot of the people, the, the Black Lives Matter organizer said, 
um, they're not they're, they're going to be outraged if Kamala gets passed over. And so she became the inevitable replacement candidate for Joe. Um, but she's been in bed with these control oligarchs, especially out in Silicon Valley, her entire career. I mean, back in 2003, you had a lot of these venture capitalists, uh, a lot of these Silicon Valley tech guys donating to her very early campaigns. I mean, she was first uh, district attorney prosecutor in San Francisco. Uh, eventually, she she was the uh, you know attorney general for the entire state of California, and then as senator, she they've always been uh, big backers of Kamala Harris out in Silicon Valley, right. and uh, so there a lot of them are in in uh, in all in on Kamala for 2024. Uh, talk about those players. I know that there's been such an interesting shakeup in Silicon Valley with regards to the dividing lines. You've got Peter Thiel on the one hand, Elon Musk all jumping in for Trump, splitting the Silicon Valley group in two very different categories. I don't know that there are equal categories, but certainly there has been a split. It's certainly unprecedented. Um, the Silicon Valley names that kind of backed Kamala, are, are they known? I mean, do we know those names and are they still loyal to her in this campaign? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's Bill and Melinda Gates, I mean, among the richest people in the world. Uh, Jeff Bezos and his ex-wife, Mackenzie Scott, who has a huge chunk of the Amazon fortune. Uh, she's all in on Kamala. Uh, you've got Sheryl Sandberg from Meta. Uh, she, she's all in on Kamala. She's pledging lots of money. Uh, I mentioned last time I was on Reed Hastings and Reed Hoffman. Those are the LinkedIn mm -hmm. and Netflix uh, executives. Um, and of course, I mean, there's Silicon Valley. There's also Hollywood. So Jeffrey Katzenberg, that's DreamWorks. I mean, he was Biden's uh, head fundraiser. He was one of the longest holdouts, by the way, um, saying we have to let Joe Biden decide. But of course, he's going to pledge his full support, hundreds of millions of dollars behind Kamala Harris. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg has had these, you know, quotes where he kind of, um, you know, says that uh, Donald Trump, uh, the assassination attempt was uh, one, you know, an exhilarating thing where he saw Donald Trump pump his fist. But let's not kid ourselves. Mark Zuckerberg will fully be behind uh, the Democrats and the censorship industrial complex. And so I would say 90 percent at least uh, of Silicon Valley will be behind Kamala Harris, the Google, the, you know, the Facebook, the Netflix, all of those. They'll all donate all of the employees who are very wealthy uh, in themselves, not just the big names. They'll all be donating big money to Kamala Harris have already started. I mean, that's how she's over 300 million in just, what, 20 days. It's kind of crazy how much money is flowing into the Kamala Harris campaign. I want to move over to her running mate, uh, Tim Walls. And uh, you recently have pointed out that there are some disturbing connections between Walls and China, not to mention his loving history with China. I mean, he spent his honeymoon there. He's taken students there for school trips. Um, there's a very sentimental aspect to Walls and China. But you actually highlight there's some other concerns between Walls and China monetarily. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's just start at the very beginning. Uh, Tim Walls went to China in 1989, the same year as the Tiananmen Square massacre. Like you said, he, he had his wedding uh, honeymoon there uh, after getting married on the anniversary of Tiananmen Square. He came back from his first trip and said, they just showered me with so many gifts, uh, he couldn't even bring all of the gifts home he got from his Chinese benefactors. And so one of the weirdest things about Tim Walls' early relationship with China, this is, I mean, early 90s, uh, is the fact that the Chinese Communist Party actually subsidized some of these trips. He took uh, more than 30 trips to China uh, for student exchanges, ostensibly. He would bring American students over to China. And he actually, he told them to, quote, downplay their Americanness, which is a weird thing to tell your students. I mean, I guess if you're not trying to get grabbed by the CCP. But it is very weird that the CCP subsidizes these exchanges. I've talked to multiple intelligence community experts who say that there is a 0% chance that the Chinese Communist Party would let you even run these exchanges, let alone subsidize them, if you weren't uh, doing things favorable towards the CCP. So that's the 90s. Let's fast forward to his inauguration as governor of Minnesota. This is in January 2019. 
He actually invited uh, Chinese Communist Party diplomats, consul general, to his inauguration. And then from the inauguration, the CCP diplomats and, and uh, uh, Chinese officials, they went and met with an organization called Global Minnesota. This is sort of like a control oligarch local organization in Minnesota. They're partnered with the United Nations, very pro-China. They've organized trips to China delegations to China. So this uh, Beijing official goes and meets with them. Well, th uh, that group, Global Minnesota, is partnered with a another ch pro-China organization in Minnesota that has also uh, been very supportive of walls. And that organization is running a secret uh, CCP police station. This was a great report uh, out of the Daily Caller a couple of years ago about how the Chinese Communist Party has these secret police stations and they use these offices. Uh, there's only seven of them that we know of throughout the country. One of them in Minnesota, they use these footholds to go and harass and intim intimidate uh, C uh, Chinese dissidents, you know, people who've come to America to criticize the CCP. Well, the CCP is operating at, out of Minnesota and it's an organization tied to Wall. So, I mean, the, the connections are crazy. Um, he's spoken at a number of events that are sponsored by uh, Chinese intelligence front companies. Uh, this is called the United <laughs> Front. Uh, Tim Walls has gone and spoken at these pro-CCP events as a guest of honor. He's a headliner on the schedule. So, uh, you know, it's not just the stolen valor that is so atrocious, and, and it is atrocious. It's the idea that we could have a vice president who is totally compromised by the Chinese Communist Party. Imagine that. I wonder where we've heard that story before, Seamus. <laughs> again. Here we go again. Here we go again. Seamus Bruner, always an informative visit with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chanel. For all our viewers asking where One America News is heading in the future, we would like to introduce you to OAN Live. OAN Live is the best way to stay up to date on all of the hard-hitting, straight-shooting, national and international headlines. And the best part is, OAN Live is only $4.99 per month. All the credible, honest, unbiased reporting One America News offers at a fraction of the cost of cable. Just go to OANN.com to easily sign up for OAN Live and stay informed.